Good evening, how is everybody? I'm uh, Tom Stevens, and I'm the president of the Friends of the Archives, and we are a uh, uh, tax-exempt organization that exists to help the Limestone County Archives in things that the, the, the county doesn't provide. Uh, we help them make <coughs> making and, and, and books and buying buying outside materials and, and stuff like this, volunteering stuff. Well, we recently purchased another computer and we're looking at possibly uh, purchasing another one to, to, to go. That's what we do. We exist to help the archives with what they need to do. Uh, tonight, before we have our regular business meeting, we're going to have a, uh, a presentation. This is James Martin. He is our vice president, but he's also a bit of a world traveler. He was born in England, and uh, how he ended up here is a long and probably sordid tale. Uh, <laughs> still, but, uh, still asking myself that question. He's somewhat of an expert on scrounging and, and, and through old stuff and looking and taking his uh, metal, detector. metal detector out and, and doing all this kind of stuff and pulling up uh, all kinds of artifacts and I'm not going to take up his time. Ladies and gentlemen, James Martin. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as, uh, as was said, uh, yeah, I'm from England originally, uh, came to the States in 85, did six years active duty in the Marine Corps, did another 20 years in the Marine Corps Reserve, total 26 years, retired as a Sergeant Major in the Marine Corps, and then during that time also I did 24 years as a Utah State Trooper out in Utah. Uh, moved to Alabama a couple of years ago and uh, brought my hobby slash obsession, depending on who you talk to, with me. Um, <coughs> So photo was taken me probably about a decade ago. Uh, this is out in uh, southwest Wyoming. And this right here is there. It says USR, United States Reservation. That's one of the reservation boundary markers for Fort Bridger. And that one dates from 1858. Still sitting out there on public property, free for anybody to go look at, not touch. Just go look at, take a photograph of it, and uh, admire. I admire it for what it is. Uh, coming out here, I want to try something different out here. And uh, so what I figured I'd start looking for is the old home sites. And I'm specifically talking about the pre-Civil War sites where you had, <clears throat> you'd have a family come out here, say from Virginia in the 1820s. They built their log cabin, their little thing that was probably smaller than this room we're in right now. And they build their cabin, clear the woods, put the farm out there, for 30 years, and then in 1849, what happened in 1849? Gold rush. Gold rush. <clears throat> so now you got this guy in Alabama, he's looking at his log cabin that for the last 30 years the dinner bell's been ringing for the termites. Probably the first, the first three layers of logs have either been eaten away or rotten. The cabin's probably not even sitting straight, and he's like, there's gold to be found in California. Sells his land moves the family, heads west. The person who buys his land has this cabin sitting here, and he's probably living in a cabin that is probably no bigger than this room. And he looks and he goes, you know what, I could build a dog truck out of what's left of here. So he takes what he can use, moves it to his cabin, builds himself a dog truck house, and with the rest of it, he either just lets it rot, or he burns it. And, and then what happens is, that field now becomes a farm field, and there's the cemetery sitting over there that over the last 30 years, grandma who died, little Johnny who fell off the horse and died, they've been buried and they've been left there. So what I look for is I'm looking for the cemetery sitting out there on their own because I know somewhere within a quarter mile of that cemetery, there's gonna be a home site. And that's what I started with when I first, when I first got here. So moving on, <coughs> time is valuable. Like I said, hobby or obsession? depending on who you, uh, who you talk to. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, uh, obviously, rough estimate on my part, I'd say three quarters of this hobby or obsession is research. Be it sitting at the computer, <coughs> be it being in here bugging April for the books, or, or reading through newspapers online, and what have you. 75% of it is actually research before and after going out there and looking for these home sites. Uh, my source of information, obviously history books, uh, official reports and journals and diaries, your online maps, 
I've got a couple of examples later on. Um, BLM Glow, that is not the uh, Black Lives Matter, that is the Bureau of Land Management, General Land Office. That website is an absolute gold mine, especially when you want to find, uh, especially out west, they've got, they show where houses were and stuff like that. Back here, not so much, but it's still a gold mine if you want to find out who lived on this township and range at a certain time, who were the first people to lay claim to the property out here, especially out here in, in Alabama. Um, library, local newspapers, obviously archives, and your local stories are hearsay. You know, uh, when I was in Utah, I'd go to the local restaurants and you'd find the old timers and the old retired farmers out there, and they'd be sitting there telling stories and stuff, and you'd go in and say, hey, can you tell me anything about this location? And next thing you got all these stories coming, well, I remember when so-and-so did this, and I heard this, and I've heard about the cannon that's been buried here. If I can tell you the number of times I've heard about cannons buried out west. Um, we'll wait. I bet during the days of steam, it must have sounded awesome to hear that ch -ch 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 as it went by, as opposed to the loud diesel. Plus, you didn't have to ring bells. Uh, okay, so. When I've, when I've done my research, there's a spot I want to I look into, and I've found as much research as I can find <coughs> determine the owner. Um, out west, it was a lot easier for me because you may have a, a swath of land, 10,000 acres, and there's one farm on that 10,000 acres. It was just the point of driving to that farm, knocking on the door, giving my spiel. And invariably, out west, a lot of them were cattle farmers. They either knew the history or they didn't know the history. Nine times out of 10, they knew the history, but they really didn't care. They were more concerned, spring's coming, the, cat, the cattle, the calves are being born, we've got to wean the calves, we've got to get the hay for the winter time, and there's winter, and now we've got to feed the cattle through the winter. They really, they were like, they'd be like, how about it, show me if there's anything important. And then very, I'd go show them what I found. And they'd be like, oh, that's nice. And I'd make a display case. And they'd be like, and in, very, in nine times out of 10, when I gave somebody a display case, they would be, go for it. Don't even have to let me know you're on the property. Just go for it. Out here, it's a little different. You got properties out here where you want to get permission. And the owner might be in uh, Birmingham or Montgomery or Tennessee or Georgia. So it's a little bit more challenging finding the property on here or getting contact. Um, again, county records, city hall, archive society asking around the neighborhood and such. Um, now I'm going to get into the meat and potatoes. I told you I'd cut it short. I really did cut this down. Um, I'm going to just show that this was not a flash in the pan with me moving here. This is a ghost town in northern Utah. <clears throat> it dated from 1872 to 1891. Um, that photograph is my photograph that was taken with my drone in the spring of 2019, I think. And what you see are building sites. You can see the buildings where they sat. I mean, who thought crop marks in the United States, right? You think crop marks were thinking Europe, Iron Age, Roman crop marks from where the buildings were, sat, were there, were at and such. But this was actually a ghost town. Uh, the railroad actually ran along the north. And even the locals didn't know the name of the town. They actually had, they thought this area was called for another town that was two miles down the road. And that place I never got to. Once I hit this place, I knew I was going to be here until, until I, you know, I, I found myself leaving Utah. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was really good to, to validate what the history book said about this place. I was finding stuff from the 18s, all the way from the 1870s all the way through the 1890s. Uh, research for this, um, this was like the Bible out there in, in the county that I lived in, Box Elder County. Uh, lots of photographs, I love pictures. You know, I, I'm, I'm one of those people who, when I look at a book, I look at the pictures first, then I'll read the narrative if I have to. Um, but using the photographs of where the buildings were at, the background, I was able to figure out where the buildings were at. Um, and again, the uh, Bureau of Land Management, Globe, 
website it was very, very helpful. A lot more detailed. This was actually a track of the railroad that went through. It was a narrow gauge that went through, went all the way from Ogden, Utah, all the way through, uh, curved round up into, uh, up into Idaho, Montpellier, uh, Idaho. And then, uh, and that was actually the first location at town. That town ended up moving two more times after that to its present location. Some of the finds, um, Union Pacific Railway tags. Now the Union Pacific Railroad in the 1860s, that's what it was called in the 1860s and it's called that now. During the 1880s they changed the name to the Union Pacific Railway. So these bag seals, I've never seen them before, before I dug this place. Um, hard to see but that's an 1877 quarter. Chances are it's a Carson City, the back side was worn to where you couldn't see the mid mark. And then uh, one of these is a dime from 1886, and the other one's a dime from 1876, the same year Custer got massacred out there, a little big one. So, uh, this here says H.D. Dunlap O. Well, back then the, in the 19th century, O meant Ohio. This H.D. Dunlap, he actually died in his 30s from, uh, from um, pneumonia, but he was a doctor. And I actually contacted the historical society from the county that he was in, and I asked him, do you have any records of him coming out to Utah? And he, they actually said, no, we have no record. The only thing I can think is that this is some type of calling card. So he may have met somebody on the train, or, and he goes, here, you know, if you're ever in, I think it was Canton, Ohio. If you're ever in Canton, just give this to the local hotel, and you know, I'll pay for your room, you know, if you come as a guest. I'm just surmising, that's the only thing I can think of. And then baggage, uh, the old baggage tag, and this one is actually says, uh, Union Depot, Ogden, Utah, that's the Union Pacific Railroad tag. So the fines, the fines were everything I'd expect to find in a railroad tag. Lots of iron. I gave that to people that, that were associated with uh, railroad museums out there, but I found all sorts of stuff relating to the, be it the, the narrow gauge railroad that was out there at the time. Okay, old Ama, Alabama home sites. This is the, the meat and potato everybody's here for. <coughs> the research. Um, these books are available here, I believe. Um, or you can find them online. I actually purchased this book in Utah when I knew I was coming out here. And I knew I had to do something with the obsession. And when I found this book, I was like, it's like you could hear the orchestral music start. Like, I was so happy with this. I was like, yep, this is exactly what I'm looking for. This has been very interesting too, the tombstone inscriptions, and obviously the, the family maps of Limestone County, Alabama. I do have other books. I've got the Southern Claims book. Um, they all help build the picture and narrow down where palm sites could possibly be. Uh, Gaia GPS, this is an app that I use on my phone. Uh, it's also on my iPad and on my laptop. It all talks to each other. If I enter something on my laptop, it goes to my phone, goes to my iPad, and vice versa. And another great website is the Perry Castaneda Library Map Collection. And I believe that's the University of Texas. That is a, that's a, if you want pre-1945 topographical maps, that is the one you want to get. You want to get on. Uh, there's a slew of other websites. I've probably got hundreds of bookmarks on my on my uh, my computer. And sometimes I, I may go to one every day or I may not go to one for a, a couple of weeks. <coughs> Thomas Phillips site. Thomas Phillips, um, he actually owned a store up uh, near the, uh, what was the name of the, the Indian boundary? Ragsdale Creek. Oh, Ragsdale Creek, yeah. Above Pettis, little matter, yeah. He owned property out there. There's a store in the 1830s. There's actually an 1830s map of Alabama that shows the store. Um, this is not that site. This is another site which just so happened to have his name attached to it. Uh, he got it in 1849. <clears throat> he, he, he had the site in 1849 and then sometime between that and 1868, Dr. There we go. Dr. Cargill Jones, Massenburg. He has the Massenburg house up there in Pedersville. The house is still standing. Um, he purchased it. The crazy thing is, the 1868 plat map, 1868 is when Cardinal Jones Massenburg passed away. 
and he's buried down in the Massenburg Henderson Cemetery there, just uh, east of Elkhart. So, but it's a single 48-acre lot, and the reason I went, I looked at this one, was because there were, his name was not associated with any of the lots alongside. So there wasn't 80 acres, there wasn't 160 acres. It was just a 40-acre lot that he had at the time. So I was like. <clears throat> There had to be something out there. You wouldn't just have 40 acres well away from all your other properties. There had to be something out there. And I went out there and actually I did find, I found some evidence of, of um, occupation in the area. Um, again, using that BLM Globe website, that came in really handy, narrowing it down. And then there's the flat map. Right there says C.J. Massenburg. This is the 1868 flat map. 1849 is in that first book that was here talking about the families of Limestone County. Um, interesting note, 1849, there was also, this was a single lot, and this was to a Mary Williams. And all I know about, I found out about her is she died in the 1930s, age 92. So Mary A. Williams, she owned this lot in the 1840s, and at some point, that's a William Brown right there, he purchased it. It could have been it could have been that she got married and moved away. I don't know. But again, single lot. Generally, if there's a single lot, you've got 40 acres to search to look for a cabin site. So I went out there, and these are the finds. are actually here on the table, too. Not much yet. The grass, uh, the last two times I've been out there, uh, uh, walked out there, and the cattle have looked at me and said, uh, no, not today. Especially, I actually went out there this morning, and there was the cattle out there with their new, with their young calves, and I was like, eh, I'm not even, I'm not even gonna cross that bridge. But um, mule shoe, square nails, uh, parts of a pewter plate. So that's early right there. But that is actually part of the rim of the pewter plate. Um, that's actually a squashed shotgun. I think it's a shotgun base, which is outside the time frame I'm looking at, but it is flat and so flat. It makes me wonder if at some point any somebody who was living in that area maybe used it as a poker chip. I don't know. That's uh, a uh, Paracel slider. Obviously a decorative uh, fork or spoon handle and part of a harmonica reed. <coughs> there is other stuff out there. I've just got to wait for the cattle to be done and for that field to get mowed down this winter. And then I can get back out there. Um, Collier Blackwell, home site. Um, I'm sure there's a fair few of you who are familiar with this site. Um, the cemetery is up here. This is actually a well. There's actually a photograph in the uh, Lure and Lure of Limestone County from the 1970s where the well is still intact. Uh, this is a uh, property that's owned by um, Jim Devaney, and I have permission to be out there. Uh, he told me when he was a child, interesting story, now, when he was a child, some of the local farm workers that worked for his dad at the time lowered him down on a rope into the well. And there is a cave that heads down towards the river. He, he confirmed what I was told by a farm worker. One day I was out here and they were getting ready to harvest or something like that. And he said he'd heard that there was a tunnel down there. Well, Mr. Devaney confirmed that, yes, there was a tunnel down there. Of course, now it's all filled and it's collapsed in, you know, unless you dig out the whole well, you're never going to get to it. Um, the photograph in the 1970s shows one tree here. That's it, so, and uh, sad to say that cemetery is in a sad state of affairs. <clears throat> so, on this place, uh, James and Olivia, uh, Elizabeth Collier, they moved, uh, to Madison County, 1818, from Virginia. I've since found out that Myrtle Grove is most like between Mooresville and Triana along the coast. Uh, the Colliers owned a swarm of property on the north side of the Tennessee River back then. So chances are it's on TVA property or it's even underwater. So that's, a, that's gonna be a, I'm not gonna be looking for that place at all. Uh, the interesting thing also I found out, it's called the, Black, the Collier Blackwell House yet it's called the Blackwell Collier Cemetery. I, gosh, I'm just going to go out my breath. That's, seriously, it's called the Blackwell Collier Cemetery. Which to me is weird. I don't know why they got the name switch. Anyway, so a little more research. 
That is the home right there. This is uh, 1935, he showed a house there. Now there was a house up there until about 10 years ago. That was a, uh, uh, what's the word they use? They use out here for the farmers. Uh, tenant farmer. Sharecropper. Sharecropper, Sharecro thank you, sharecropper. Mm -hmm. So it was probably a sharecropper house that was there from the 1930s on. Uh, Best I could tell that the, the original house had burnt down prior to this. <clears throat> so, but it does show in this 1941 aerial, this would be the main road now, and it did show that the road went up here and there was a line of trees. Obviously, all these trees are gone. The well is down here and such. And then uh, looking at the other topos, this is 1951, as you can see, there's there's the main road that's there now, and then there's the, uh, the driveway still going up there. Interesting picket point. So I saw that, I was like, hmm, what if that soldier's picketed there? That's why it's called picket point. I don't know. But there was, there was a road that came out here on the earlier map. I've yet to get out to this field and see if there's anything out there. And then uh, later in 1973, that road has since disappeared, been plowed over, and there's no indication of a house at all, and it's just a cemetery. And some of the finds here, this is where I found some really old, some really cool iron. I like finding old iron. Uh, handmade, hand auger, hand drill. Uh, obviously, uh, handmade uh, hammer. The cool thing about this is I'd like to think that this was used to build the house. Because you know, they use wooden pegs and pins and stuff. Uh, I'd like to think that that was used to drill the holes into the logs. <laughs> And then when they put it up, they have, you know, that was used. Yeah, handmade, like handmade bit. Yes, yeah, right yeah, bit. Yeah, okay. I'd like to think that that was used. Um, obviously, the buttons, <clears throat> and uh, this is a, uh, a uh, shotgun, black powder shotgun lead pellet dispenser. It would have had a pouch, another pouch, all your lead shot would have been in there. It would have had three gates, you open one gate. You open the back gate with this gate shut here, you, you, your lead shot would pour in there, you then close that gate. That way you know you had an equal measure of, of uh, lead shot each time you fired. And then this here is a Memphis to Charleston uh, railroad tag. So this is actually Confederate railroad um, baggage tag there. Not very clear, um, but it is here on the table if you want to look a bit closer. Um, this site still has plenty to give. I know it does, it's just got a lot of iron and it's got the mineralized soil. Uh, recently I just purchased a, uh, a new used metal detector that can handle the mineralized soil and it's been, a, it's been an absolute game changer in terms of finding stuff. Uh, you've got to have that, you've got to have that machine that can get to the mineralized soil out here. Right? So you're going to be finding nothing deep, three inches. So, um, oh. so end notes. By no means am I an expert. I know so I was an expert. I'm not an expert at this. Um, there are other methods out there that people use, um, but I guess it's uh, you know what's important to you in terms of uh, continuing finding the history. I like to say that with this hobby, I validate or refute what the history books say. And I can tell you there are sites out in the Western United States where after a full day, and I'm talking ten hours of metal detecting with my buddies, we've stood there in a circle, looking at each other, and we said, well, I know where it isn't. <laughs> Despite the maps, the journals, and everything else saying that something was supposed to be there. Um, of course, there's no limit to where the research you're taking. I mean, you're going down rabbit holes every time you, you pick up a book and you start reading, you say, well, let me look into this, let me look into that. Uh, is it worth it? That's the question, I guess, is worth it. For me, yes, it's worth it, it's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me, gets me out of bed every day. Uh, I enjoy the hunt, I enjoy the research. Um, I have people contact me on, on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, through my YouTube channel and stuff, and they say, hey, can you look up this? Can you tell me what this is? They send me photographs of mystery metal and, um, and what have you, and things that they got no idea what it is. And if I don't know what it is, I'll send a picture on to other people who may know what it is. Because there's people who know more than I do. So, that being said, are there any questions? Hey, do you want to turn on the lights? Mm -hmm.
I bought everybody for this street. Yes, sir. Tents to write down the app for maps. Oh, yes, sir. Gaia, G A I A G P S. G A I A G P S. And then there was another indication. Yeah, the uh, the uh, Perry Castaneda. There you go. Perry Castaneda Library Map Collection. You just bring Perry Castaneda Map Library, it'll come up with the site. Well, that was good. We enjoyed it. Short and yeah. sweet, to the point. To the point. Um, <clears throat> are there any questions? Where are you located? Where am I located? I live here in Athens, man. Oh, you do? Yes, ma'am. Uh, are you interested in some more sites? That you Absolutely. Can well, I've got some for you. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. We can talk after this. If that's okay. okay. I do too. Okay, yeah. brilliant. You mentioned you you bought a new to you used uh, upper oh, yeah. grade yeah. Uh, metal detector for somebody who might be interested in getting started. You can get metal detectors for sixty or seventy bucks. I wouldn't. No, I, I wouldn't either, but you can. You can, the, yes. The, where do you start? Something that, you're gonna start that can actually assist you in, in this. Well, my first machine was a uh, Bounty Hunter Tracker 4. I realized soon that I needed to get a better machine. So I ended up spending about 500 bucks. So 500 bucks is probably your start off. Uh, my next machine was a Technex G2. They don't even make that anymore. Uh, but that's a good machine. And I've had uh, I've had the um, Garrett AT Pro, um, but now I use I've got the XP Deus, which is I mean brand new. You're talking fifteen hundred bucks there, but the, the, the new old one that I bought was a uh, GP uh, Mine Lab GPX forty eight hundred, and it remained for a couple of years, but um, brand new. The new GPX is now coming in at six seven grade. Mm. I got this one for fifteen hundred bucks. So but, I got but someone getting into it could actually bucks. get started with a, about a four or five hundred dollars. Four five hundred dollars. Yeah. Okay. And most of the apps are free. That guy so GPS, much. I do pay for extra layers, different maps. Yeah. yeah. I pay what I pay the yearly fee. To okay. me, it's worth the fee just to, to see what you know what different maps they have on there. 